This is an example of a one sample t test. So our example starts with looking at the specific absorption rates for cell phones. Um, this is a measure of the amount of radio frequency that is absorbed by the user of the cell phone. Uh, and every cell phone emits you know, a certain amount of energy. Uh, different models obviously have different SAR measurements. Um, so in order to receive certification um, from the FCC to be sold in the United States, these SRL SAR levels for cell phones must be less than 1.6 watts per kilogram. So to investigate whether or not the average watts per kilogram is less than 1.6, data was collected and we'll conduct a one sample t-test to determine um, the results. So here's a table that displays all of the information for a random sample of 30 different cell phones. So the main question here, does the data suggest that the true mean SAR level for cell phones is in fact less than 1.6 watts per kilogram? So to start, what we need to do is identify the variable of interest and the population. So the first question you should always ask yourself, what is the variable of interest and is it quantitative or categorical? For our example, SAR level is what we're recording on every single cell phone, and it is a numerical measure, so our variable of interest is quantitative. Our next question should be, what is the population of interest, and is there only one? In this case, we're trying to generalize to all cell phones. We're asking the question if the mean SAR level is in fact less than 1.6 watts per kilogram, so that is just one single population. Next, we need to assess whether or not we feel the sample is representative of the population. So do we believe that the sample was gathered in such a way that the data represent the population data, uh, which is essentially all cell phones? Now the problem, if I go back into the details, says that a random sample of phones was collected. Uh, since a random sample was collected, we can assume that the sample data rep represent the population data. Uh, in reality, you might want to take a minute to think about how the data was collected and whether or not you feel that it was collected in such a way that we can generalize to that larger population. In step three of hypothesis testing, I really want to determine if I'm going to do a hypothesis test or can my, an my question be answered just with a simple estimation problem. In this case, we're asking the question, is the true mean SAR levels for cell phones less than 1.6 watts per kilogram? Since we are testing this claim, a hypothesis test is what we need to conduct. So a hypothesis test problem is what we have for this example. In step four, I need to actually now write down that null and alternative. Now I find it just a little bit easier to write down the alternative first. That's because our question of interest is usually in the form of uh, a statement that corresponds to our alternative hypothesis. The notation for the alternative hypothesis is a capital A with a sub excuse me, capital H with the sub subscript A. And so then I want to state that the mean mu is less than 1.6 watts per kilogram. So in notation, I've got that written out, but in words, what I'm stating as an alternative, again, this is what the researcher believes, the true mean SAR level for cell phones is less than 1.6 watts per kilogram. Well, now that I have the alternative written down, I can sort of form the null hypothesis from that. The null hypothesis has very similar notation. The subscript on the H changes from an A to a zero, and then the symbol changes from a less than to an equal to sign. So my null hypothesis is that the mean SAR level is equal to 1.6 watts per kilogram. Now remember, this is a statement of no difference or no effect or nothing's happening. So in other words, we would assume uh, mu is equal to 1.6. Uh, will the alternative be a one-sided or a two-sided test? Well, it's going to be a one-sided test because in that alternative, we have that less than symbol. 
Now in step five, I want to explore the data, and there's two reasons for this. The standardized sample means are only going to follow a T distribution if the sample came from a normal population or the sample size is large enough. What I really need is the sampling distribution of the sample mean to be normal, and I'll get that if either of those two things is happening. The other reason why I want to look at the data is I want to get a sense of whether or not the null hypothesis could be rejected, and that's another important piece. So making a graph of the sample data, uh, I have a histogram here, and it does look like there's a little bit of a left skewed shape happening. Um, now, my sample size, as I can tell from the fave stats down at the bottom of the screen, is 30. Now, we've been told that a sample size of 30 or more can be considered large enough. So we're right on the edge, but I might be able to get away with saying my sample size is large enough Therefore, we believe that the sampling distribution will in fact be normal. One other graph that I could use to assess, to assess normality, it's called a normal probability plot. Uh, in R, it's called a normal QQ plot. Now, to get this plot, uh, it involves two simple lines in R, um, but the important piece is really how to read it. The dots represent uh, the, the data, and the closer the points are to the reference line, the closer the data is to normal. Now the reference line is that diagonal line, and I can see that not many of my points are actually on the line, and there's a bit of an S shape that's occurring. This does indicate that I have a slightly skewed graph, which we could see in the histogram on the previous page. Now because my sample size is 30, I'm not going to worry too much and uh, again, I'm going to say that my sampling distribution is probably normal, which means I can use T methods. So should T methods be used for this hypothesis test? I'm going to say my sample looked only slightly skewed, uh, and my sample size was 30, which is right on the edge of being large enough. Therefore, my decision would be that a T test is a pretty robust test. Therefore, a sample size of 30 and a sample that is only slightly skewed, we can feel comfortable using the T method. So I'm going to go ahead and proceed with using those T methods. All right, in step six, I get to determine the p-value. So recall that the sample mean uh, for the data was 0 0.9904. What values of the sample mean are considered as or more unusual? Now I need to know this because I'm going to have to determine the p-value. This is an important piece. So if I was to draw a number line, which represents the distribution of sample means, on this number line you draw anywhere the null hypothesized value. Now in this case it was 1.6 watts per kilogram. Then on this number line, you write down where is the observed sample mean. So it would fall about here or so on the number line. Next is to just recall what the alternative hypothesis looked like. So we said that the alternative was that the mean uh, kilowatts per uh, watts per kilogram was less than 1.6. So the more unusual part would be all sample means that are less than 9.9, .9, excuse me, 0 0.9904. So all of these values down below. So this tells me that any sample mean that has a value of 9.9904 or less would be considered as or more unusual. I have to keep this in mind when I'm finding the p-value later on. So to calculate the test statistic, I need to first remember what the t-statistic looks like. A t-statistic has the form sample mean minus the null hypothesized value divided by sample standard deviation over the square root of the sample size. So using the fave stats in the upper right hand corner, I have a sample mean of 0.9904 minus 
1.6, and then I'll divide that difference by the standard error. That is 0.4234 over the square root of my sample size, which is 30. Oh my goodness, look at this. We have a really negative T statistic, negative 7.89. Now every t-statistic has a degree of freedom that goes along with it. For a one sample t-test, the degrees of freedom is n minus one. So in this case, we have 29 degrees of freedom. Uh, finally, what I need is the p-value. So using our code, I can use the function pt. Now remember we get the, uh, we can use this function, but it always will give us the lower tail unless I tell it otherwise. So all the first value I need to enter in is the t statistic, negative 7.89. The next value I have to give this function is the degrees of freedom, 29. And then I'm going to specify that we do in fact want the lower tail. Remember that picture we drew? That all sample means less than or equal to 0.9904 would be considered more unusual. Well, this is uh, correspond, the p value corresponds to that area to the left. All right, when I go to R, I find that p value to be extremely small, very, very small. So I'll report the p value as being less than 0 0.0001. Now all that's left is to make my conclusion. With such a small p value, I do get to reject the null hypothesis. So that null hypothesis has been rejected, and now I get to say there is strong evidence to suggest that the true mean SAR level for cell phones is less than 1.6 watts per kilogram.